today, we stand on the brink of a whole new world of medical science, one known as regenerative medicine. Throughout the centuries, advances in medical science have often been met with skepticism. Medical procedures such as blood transfusions, vaccinations, birth control, surgical sterilization, in vitro fertilization, and organ transplantation were initially rejected by some. All of these techniques have become universally accepted and essential to daily medical practice. Now, with this potential breakthrough of regenerative medicine, doctors may actually be able to cure diseases, not just treat them with pills and shots. Insulin-producing cells may very soon be used to cure diabetes. Retinal cells could potentially make the blind see. Quadriplegics may walk again. Stem cell research may have the ability to cure over 130 million Americans plagued by chronic degenerative diseases and conditions. This is the potential that stem cell research holds for us. What are stem cells? Stem cells are the basic building blocks of our bodies with the unique ability to turn into cells that make up our tissues, bones, and organs. Stem cells have the potential to replace cell tissue that has been damaged or destroyed by severe illness or injury. The National Institutes of Health and the National Academy of Sciences the two premier science arms of the government call stem cells the internal repair system for the body. In addition to their future therapeutic use, stem cells already help scientists understand the causes of incurable diseases and conditions in order to prevent, treat, and cure them. Regenerative medicine will focus on two types of stem cells, adult stem cells and early or embryonic stem cells. The term adult does not mean that these cells are from adults, but rather they are cells that are committed or programmed to become a specific type of cell, such as a blood cell, skin cell, or any of the over 200 different cell lines of the human body. The term embryonic, on the other hand, refers to more potent cells that have not yet been committed or programmed to become any particular type of cell. So, they have the potential to become any cell of the human body. What makes early or embryonic stem cells different from adult stem cells? Adult stem cells have been studied for over 40 years and have been used to successfully treat diseases of the blood, such as leukemia and lymphomas. In the few short years since the discovery of early or embryonic human stem cells, researchers have successfully demonstrated, in animal models, the even greater potential of these more potent stem cells to reverse incurable diseases and conditions in animals. Researchers are studying embryonic stem cells to learn how to make adult stem cells more useful, but mainstream science is in agreement that early or embryonic stem cells, the only cells with the capacity to become any cell type of the human body, have much greater potential than adult stem cells. Adult stem cells are extremely useful in medicine. We've known that uh, since the mid-1970s, the great work that was done in the cancer field. Uh, adult stem cells have been around for quite a long time, and they're extremely useful. And we certainly want that research, as well as that clinical application, to continue. However, uh, we all know that, uh, that adult stem cells are uh, limited in what they can do. Embryonic stem cells are much more useful and uh, less of a problem when it comes to immune rejection. Early or embryonic human stem cells presently come from two sources. First, they may be produced from leftover fertilized eggs from in vitro fertilization clinics where they would otherwise be discarded. Or, secondly, they may potentially be made from a laboratory procedure called somatic cell nuclear transfer, or SCNT. 
When couples undergo in vitro fertilization treatments, more fertilized eggs are produced than are needed. The surplus fertilized eggs are frozen for one of three purposes, for possible future use by the couple, for donation to other infertile couples, or for medical research. The remaining eggs will ultimately be discarded as medical waste. It is estimated that there are currently over 400,000 frozen fertilized eggs at in vitro fertilization clinics, many of which will ultimately be thrown out. Instead of being flushed down the drain, these cells can be used for stem cell research that has the potential to save countless lives. How are stem cells derived from an IVF fertilized egg? After about five days in a petri dish where the fertilized egg has been dividing, a small clump of cells, the stem cells, form in the inner cell mass of the developing cell mass now called a blastocyst. These cells are undifferentiated, meaning there are no organs, and the cells still have the potential to become any cell type in the body. These cells are placed in culture and may be directed into specialized cell types that can potentially be used to treat patients or to study the underlying causes of diseases. The second source for early or embryonic stem cells is a laboratory procedure still unproven in humans called somatic cell nuclear transfer, SCNT, which begins with the patient and ends with the patient. What is SCNT? SCNT provides a unique opportunity to grow a patient's own cells for repairing or replacing his or her diseased cells. With SCNT, the nucleus containing the DNA would be removed from the patient's somatic cell, such as skin or blood cells. The nucleus containing the patient's DNA would then be transferred into an empty, unfertilized donor egg that has had the donor's nucleus and DNA removed. This manufactured cell mass containing the patient's DNA is stimulated to divide and after about five days will produce stem cells which contain the patient's DNA. Scientists could directly or indirectly differentiate these stem cells to coax them into becoming the type of cells needed to cure the patient without the complication of rejection because these cells contain the patient's DNA. If this process can be perfected, these specialized cells could then be transferred into the patient to repair or replace the damaged cells without being rejected. This laboratory process of copying the patient cells is sometimes called therapeutic cloning. What is the difference between an embryo from a fertilized egg and the cell mass created by SCNT? With a fertilized egg, the DNA comes from a man, the sperm cell, and a woman, the egg cell. So the genes necessary for fetal development are programmed to be properly expressed, making further development possible if the fertilized egg implants in a uterus. This would not be the case with SCNT. With SCNT, the DNA comes from the patient's somatic cell not the union of a sperm cell and an egg cell. Without certain developmental components that originate in the sperm, the genes necessary for fetal development do not properly express. Why don't adult stem cells replace the need for early or embryonic stem cells? The problem with using only adult stem cells in regenerative medicine research is that they exist in limited numbers, they are difficult to identify, to isolate, to purify, and they are more likely to be rejected and to have abnormalities than cells derived from embryonic stem cells. We in the research community have seen a number of breakthroughs with adult stem cells that would not have been possible without the study of embryonic stem cells. We need both types of research to move forward. Are there other sources that can create early or embryonic stem cells? Some researchers are studying alternative methods of creating stem cell lines, 
For example, some researchers want to remove a single cell from a developing embryo to create stem cells, and then allow the embryo to continue to develop. However, these methods have not proven that they can generate viable stem cell lines and may actually raise additional ethical concerns. They should not be considered alternatives to current stem cell research. In a few short years, proof of concept studies using early or embryonic stem cells in animal models have shown remarkable results. Injured mice and rats have been made to walk again. Insulin-producing cells have reversed diabetes in animals. And a stem cell engineering company has now developed a process that efficiently converts human embryonic stem cells into insulin-producing cells. Cells that die in Parkinson's disease have been reproduced in monkeys. Potential has been demonstrated for rebuilding damaged hearts. These are only a few of the examples of the power of stem cell research using early or embryonic stem cells. Because the lives of over 130 million Americans may benefit from this vital form of research, the vast majority of scientists from the leading medical schools, 40 Nobel laureates, all the leading medical and advocacy organizations, and the leadership of our National Institutes of Health and National Academy of Sciences all agree both adult and embryonic stem cells are critical pieces of the puzzle that will lead us to the pathways to cures, but we must have all the pieces to solve the puzzle. But the puzzle pieces are scattered. In spite of the fact that a majority of Congress has voted for expanded federal support for embryonic stem cell research, the United States lacks cohesive federal policy with a clear ethical framework. This leaves the individual states grappling with how to handle this new science, creating legislation ranging from research bans to state-initiated funding. All of this has had a chilling effect on research which is forcing the ultimate results further and further into the future. In the United States, where both the quality of science and the dignity of life are of uppermost concern, we have an obligation to pursue and advance all forms of legitimate medical research. We must accept the responsibility to create an appropriate ethical framework for stem cell research to ensure its progress toward curing and healing mankind's most noble and compassionate goal. Embryonic stem cell research can sound complicated, but the bottom line is that these tiny cells hold the promise to treat and potentially cure diseases and disorders that have touched all of our lives, cancer, heart disease, juvenile diabetes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, autoimmune diseases, and perhaps even spinal cord injuries, just to name a few. We must allow this research to have a fiscally supportive and ethically sound environment to reach its potential to cure degenerative diseases and conditions that deny people normal productive lives and end lives too soon. My name is Chris Goulden. I'm a former police officer and triathlete. Due to a spinal cord injury, I'm now paralyzed. In my dreams, I still walk and run. I wake up every morning hoping for a cure. I bet you know someone who hopes for a cure. Someone with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, or diabetes.